Is it, are we live? We are live now. Yes. Hey, folks. <laughs> Welcome. It is about <laughs> about a minute and a half, two minutes. We'll be getting started. Okay. So thanks for joining us online, and we'll be starting. I say in maybe about ninety seconds to two minutes. Okay. So thanks for tuning in, as they say, and we'll be back in just a second. Okay. <laughs> Used to this whole TV thing. <laughs> so. Okay. There were a couple that were pregnant and a couple that had little ones there. Yeah. Allison, at the appropriate time, would you distribute that? Appropriate. <laughs> I, I have a so I don't have to right. walk away from the, I can do that. the camera. When I say, I'll probably say, Allison, <laughs> now is the appropriate time. Yeah. Yeah. You want your rank time. Oh, you know it. Yeah. Yeah. Does, <laughs> does, a, does a bear live in the woods? Yeah. <laughs> All right. On that the, side. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would rather. Uh, tomorrow, you'll have it. Okay. From Sunday, you'll have it. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Since it's going to be just a general lake sale, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That's not this Sunday. That's a week from the 7th. The 7th. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Good evening. Hey folks, couple, about another minute. Okay, well, I think I'm going to get going. I've got, uh, I've got a minute or two after, so I know a few folks may be sneaking in here in the next minute or two. And uh, again, to you folks who are watching us on Facebook Live right now, we're glad you're here and glad you're joining us or joining us later or whether it's Wednesday night, we're glad you're here too. Um, if you've forgotten in the last week, we are in the 10th chapter of the book of Acts. Actually, we kind of... Uh, it snuck into the 11th chapter, but just to recap what's happening at this point in the book of Acts, it is one of the great turning points in the history of Christianity, which you may not really think about how momentous what's happening here is. And I'm going to, Allison, would you close the door? Um, don't lock it so people can get in, but uh, we'll let the noise get down. We talked about last week this, this story that starts with Cornelius, a... Roman centurion, a Gentile, but a Gentile who um, was drawn to the Jewish faith, drawn to the Jewish understanding of God, how he receives a vision that he is to send messengers to retrieve this man, Simon Peter, uh, and that he, Simon Peter will come and share God's message with him. Then we shift over to Simon Peter, who is sleeping on the roof or at least kind of napping on the roof of a man named uh, uh, Simon the Tanner. And as Peter is getting hungry, waiting for a meal up there on the roof, he has a vision. And the vision is of a sheet coming down from heaven full of non-kosher animals. Um, and we talked about the Jewish food laws, the Jewish kosher laws, that uh, for land animals they had to be an animal that had a cloven hoof and chewed its cud, uh, which meant they could eat lamb and they could eat 
beef, uh, but they couldn't eat pork, for example. They couldn't eat pork. And for sea life, uh, whatever they ate had to have scales, which meant they couldn't eat crustaceans, couldn't eat shrimp or lobster or crab or things like that. And so what was on this sheet, it's not detailed, it just says a sheet full of unclean animals and a voice that said to Peter in this vision, take some, kill it, eat it. Peter says, oh no, 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 I know better than that. I know not to eat non-kosher food. Uh, I've never eaten non-kosher food in my whole life. I'm not going to start now. I know better than that. And the voice says, don't call anything non-kosher. Remember the word kosher means clean. Don't call anything unclean that God has made. And he has this vision, which then, as soon as he's awakened from that vision, he's told there are men waiting outside the door of his friend's house who want to talk to him. And these men are the messengers from Cornelius who said, our, our boss, our master has sent us because he had a vision that you would come and talk to him. Will you come with us? So the vision serves two prompt purpose. The vision, on one hand, remember, is telling us that the kosher laws that the Jews had lived under for hundreds and hundreds of years don't apply to us Gentiles. Um, and as I said, we can have a, a ham sandwich and pork ribs and, you know, those kinds of things, and crab and lobster and all those things, because the kosher laws now do not apply. But the vision of the, of the non-kosher food was really a way of telling Peter, don't call anything unclean that God has made, as in Gentiles. Don't, because for the Jew, not only were certain foods unclean, certain people were unclean, and remember, that has nothing to do with hygiene or dirt. Clean as in ceremonially clean, as in acceptable for a Jew to touch or be in the presence of. The message is also about not calling non-Jewish people unclean. And so that vision of the food is what gives Peter permission to go with these men to the house of a Gentile. And so that's kind of where we got to last time, and we uh, kind of ended up right in the middle of chapter 10 when uh, they arrive at the house. Peter arrives with some of his friends, some of his fellow Jews, so we're at Acts 10 in the middle of verse 23, okay? So, Acts 10, middle of verse 23. The next day, Peter started out with them, them being the messengers from Cornelius. Some of the brothers from Joppa went along. In other words, some other Jewish Christians from Joppa, where Peter had been staying at this house of Simon the Tanner. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius, remember Caesarea is like the military capital for the Roman Empire in that part of the world, in Judea and uh, Samaria and Galilee. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, which is something no good Jew would do, <laughs> enter the house of a Gentile. So right there, entering Cornelius' house, he's breaking Jewish tradition and Jewish law just by walking in the door. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. So here's a Roman centurion basically kneeling in front of a Jewish fisherman, which would not be the normal way that society works. You know, think about when Jesus, back in the Sermon on the Mount, when he says, um, if someone forces you to carry their pack for a mile, carry it for two. Remember, he says, if somebody slaps you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. If someone forces you to carry their pack for a mile, carry it for a second mile. That's in reference to something that really did happen all the time. Roman law said that if any Roman soldier was passing through an occupied territory like Judea or Galilee, they could find any random person on the street and say, here, carry my gear for a mile. And that person would be required to carry the Roman soldier's gear for a mile. Not more than a mile, but for a mile. And of course, when Jesus is teaching about how to treat your 
enemies or your adversaries, he says, if someone forces you to carry their pack for a mile, carry it for two. Where we get the term, what term do we get from that? Mile. Go the second mile. When we talk about somebody doing something above and beyond, we say they've gone the second mile. That's where that comes from, which would confuse the heck out of a Roman soldier. Why would a Jew or a Christian carry his pack more than he had to, more than he was legally required to? Um, all that to say, normally the power dynamic between a Roman soldier and a Jewish fisherman would be the soldier would be giving orders and making demands and the common Jewish peasant would say, yes sir, no sir. Here, a Roman centurion bows to a Jewish fisherman. So the power dynamic is totally reversed right off the bat. And so he bows or kneels in front of Peter. It says, but Peter made him get up, stand up. He said, I'm only a man myself. No, don't kneel before me. I'm, I'm not, I'm just a human like you are. I'm just a man like you. 27, talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. So this is, isn't just Cornelius' immediate family. This is family, you know, siblings, cousins, nephews, nieces, friends. I mean, this is a large gathering in his house. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law. This is Peter talking. It's against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or to visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. This is referencing back to the sheet with the animals. God told me not to call anything impure or unclean that God made. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? So all he knows is that these men came and said, God spoke to our master, boss, commander, and said to come, for you to come and talk, but didn't really say exactly what about. So here's Cornelius' response to that, verse 30. Four days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour, at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send a Joppa for Simon, who's called Peter. He's a guest in the house of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we're all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. So, again, this Gentile centurion who has been drawn to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Jewish God, has been, you know, listening to Jews talk about their God. He wants to know more that whatever this man Peter is going to tell him. And so here's Peter's message, I guess you'd say. Here's Peter's sermon. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear Him and do what is right. That is a monumental statement for a Jew to make. As we talked about, the Jews saw themselves as the, the sole possession of God. Favorite people. Say, God doesn't show favoritism to any particular race or nation or ethnicity is, is a huge change from the Jewish mindset. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus the Messiah, who is Lord of all. You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, how He went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. So opening, and you have to remember, what we have here is, you know, if you read Peter's sermon, it would take, you know, two minutes. It's, Peter undoubtedly speaks more than two minutes. This is the cliff note version of Peter's message, no doubt. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I say cliff notes, is that way out of, they don't have those anymore, do they? <laughs> oh, do they still have cliff notes? Okay, all right. Well, I didn't know if that was still a thing. I thought it was surely all online. Probably it is online, right? Yeah, um, this is the 
I'll make another really old man reference. This is the Reader's Digest version. And, <laughs> and again, there's another reference that anybody younger than me won't understand. So the abbreviated version of his sermon, okay? The, the, the bullet point version of his sermon, which is, you, Cornelius, are probably aware of this man, Jesus. You know, that the, the message of what happened in Jerusalem and this man, Jesus of Nazareth, has become known throughout Judaism and therefore probably to anyone who's connected to Judaism or is anywhere listening to what's happening in the synagogue. The news about Jesus has spread often in Jewish circles in a negative way. You know, um, that this man was, was a false messiah or, or this man was, was crucified and, and surely he can't really be the messiah. But he says, this man, Jesus of Nazareth, was the Christ, the messiah. And he had the power of the Holy Spirit. And he went around doing good deeds and healing people and delivering people who were under the influence of, of Satan and evil. Verse 39, we are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. In other words, this is not just hearsay. I saw all this with my own eyes. I was there. I was with him. I traveled with him. I witnessed all these things. They killed him by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. So, preaching the central message of the early church, which is Jesus' death and resurrection. You know, every early sermon, every early message of Christian teaching always includes the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. He has not been seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. <coughs> Excuse me. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. <coughs> Excuse me again. So there's the message of Jesus' ministry, his healing, his good deeds, his death, his resurrection, the fact that he will judge all people, the fact that the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, pointed to him and that all who believe in Him, all who claim His name, uh, can be forgiven uh, of their sins. This is the brief version of Peter's sermon to the household of Cornelius. Verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came upon all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter, in other words, the Jews, the circumcised is just another way of saying Jews, of course, it's just Jewish men, but we know that this is a patriarchal, somewhat sexist culture. We're astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, <coughs> for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Here again, we have um, this phenomena that we've seen a couple of times already of people, when they come to faith, speaking in tongues, this ecstatic language, this sort of overwhelming ecstasy that comes out in an unknown tongue um, that some, some believe and teach is always what accompanies the coming of the Holy Spirit, but that's not what the scriptures say. Um, but it does sometimes occur, especially in the early church, that there is this phenomena of speaking in tongues when someone comes to faith. And so the Jewish believers are amazed that the Gentiles already have received this ecstatic speech gift of God. At that point, Peter says, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They've received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Now I say this is a monumental change. And I think I alluded to this at the end of last week. If, if Christianity had not reached out to Gentiles, you know, Christianity before this was a Jewish phenomenon. And even Peter, up until this point, thought Jesus had come as the Messiah for 
the Jews. That this was all within the confines of Judaism. Our Messiah has come, the one that our prophets prophesied about. Our anointed one, Messiah, the Christ. He has come for His people. He has come. Because up to this point, every Christian believer is Jewish, is born Jewish, with the possible exception of the one Ethiopian treasurer that we read about. But everybody else is Jewish. And now for God to tell Peter, the rock, to go and preach in a Gentile house and then to have Gentiles baptized says that Christianity is beyond a Jewish thing. It's not just a Jewish, Jewish phenomenon. It's, just not, it's not just a subset of Judaism. It has broken the barriers. Because when we started the book of Acts, Jesus said, go and preach in Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So now we see that first sort of crack. You know. um, so this is a huge change for Christianity to go from being a Jewish thing to a multinational, multicultural, all through the Roman Empire thing. And it doesn't... It's not immediately embraced by the church because we go to chapter 11 now. It says, um, The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea, in other words, this is the, the rest of the apostles. This is the, the Jerusalem church. This is the mother church. Heard that Gentiles had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem... So Peter goes back to Jerusalem. He's been in Joppa, then he's been to Caesarea. Now he goes back to Jerusalem. The circumcised believers, the Jewish Christians, criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. This is the, this is the core Jerusalem church saying to Peter, what, what are you thinking? What do you, what do you, what's, what, what's wrong with you? You went into Gentile houses. You ate with Gentiles. You broke our laws. And here, I read this quickly because here is a recap of everything we just read. <laughs> okay? Peter said, Peter began, explain to them, I was in the city of Joppa praying and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners. It came down where I was. I looked into it and I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds of the air. <clears throat> what kind of reptiles is he going to eat? As you're wondering at that point, I'm saying, you know, alligator meat? I'm not sure what, what reptiles are really good for eating. But anyway, um, birds of the air, I heard a voice telling me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure and clean entered my mouth. A voice spoke from heaven a second time. Don't call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times. Then it was all pulled up to heaven again. So just in case he didn't get the message of the vision the first couple of times, it, he has a three, he, has, he sees the vision three times. Then he again recounts, right then, three men who'd been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. Then these six brothers also went with me. This is, this is new information. We're not, we hadn't been told before that six Jewish Christian men went with him, which meant there were seven of them, which seven is always a Bible number. You know, seven is a, is a holy number. And in Jewish tradition, you know, the witness of seven people was often considered fully binding if seven people all testified to the same thing. So it's really kind of no accident that we have Peter plus six more. So seven people... Seven Jewish Christians went there and did this and saw this. Uh, we entered the man's house. He told us how he'd seen an angel appear at his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who's called Peter. He'll bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning, as in the day of Pentecost. Then I remember what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as He gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? Who was I to think that I could oppose God? So this is Peter's defense to the other apostles and the other church leaders. 
God spoke to this man. God spoke to me. I went to the house. They received the power of the Holy Spirit. I felt like every step of the way I was doing what God is telling me to do. How could I not do what God was telling me to do? When they heard this, verse 18, this is the Jerusalem church leaders, when they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God saying, So then, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. So this is, I say, this is a huge turning point as the church expands beyond Judaism into the Gentile world. So you really can't um, underestimate how crucial this is in the history of Christianity. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's keep going on 1119. Now, those who'd been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen, referencing back Stephen, one of the seven deacons, you know, who was arguing with the uh, synagogues, the Greek-speaking Jewish synagogues, and was a powerful, not just deacon, but a powerful preacher, hauled before the Sanhedrin, Gives them a history lesson. If you remember, we started off, he's like, our father Abraham. And he went through all that Jewish history. And then he said, you all are a bunch of closed-minded, stiff-necked, you know, who killed the prophets. And Stephen gets stoned. And that's when we first meet Saul of Tarsus at the stoning of Stephen. After that stoning of Stephen, there is an uptick in persecution of Christians. And many in Jerusalem leave Jerusalem to escape that persecution and start scattering into different areas. But, of course, what does that do? It actually ends up seeding the gospel into new territories. When they, some of them leave Jerusalem and go to other places, they carry the message of the gospel with them. So some of them went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Telling the message only to Jews. This is what happened after the stoning of Stephen. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks too, also. Telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of now Jewish Christians who take the initiative to tell Greeks about Jesus. obviously being the first, Alexandria being the second, Antioch is the third greatest city in the empire. Um, it, is, <clears throat> there's a, it is in what we today would call Turkey. Um, it goes by the name of uh, Antakya today, not Antioch, but Antakya is what it's called today. Uh, it's close to the Mediterranean. It's about 15 miles from the Mediterranean. But Antioch is a very major, major city. Um, in the first century. It's not so much today. But back then, it was a very major, major city. And, you know, we, t we read through in the, in the Gospels, and especially in the book of Acts, most of these, most major cities had a particular god or goddess that was sort of their patron, I won't say saint, but, you know, their, their patron god or goddess. Um, you know, like, uh, you know, Diana in Ephesus or things like that. Well, the, the temple in Antioch, the major temple in Antioch, was the temple of Daphne. Okay, this is a, really a deep cut of Greek mythology. Anybody have any remembrance of who Daphne was in Greek mythology? Okay, in Greek mythology, Daphne was a mortal woman who the god Apollo fell in love with. So, the god Apollo, the sun god fell in love with the mortal woman, Daphne. But to hide her from other jealous gods, he turned her into a bush, uh, which is kind of an <laughs> odd thing to do for a, a moment. But yeah, Greek mythology has a lot of that kind of stuff. But <laughs> anyway, there is the, in Antioch, there was the temple of Daphne. And since Daphne was Apollo's lover, 
The temple of Daphne was filled with sacred prostitutes. You know, which you think that's a kind of an oxymoron or a, <laughs> to have those two words together, but in many Greek and Roman temples, that was who um, served the temple, sacred prostitutes. Which, how do you worship Apollo? How do you worship the gods? Well, in the, at the temple of Daphne, the way you worshipped was to go and have sex with one of the prostitutes who worked there. That was how you worshipped um, the gods. Because remember, so much of pagan worship, not just in, in Canaan when the Jews come in and are you know, surrounded by all the ites, you know, the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the, all the other ites, all those religions had fertility cults as a part of that, which often meant the worship of those gods like, in the Old Testament, gods like Baal or Baal and Asherah and some of these other, uh, Molech, some of these other Canaanite pagan gods. Um, the way you worshipped, sometimes it was animal sacrifice, sometimes it was child sacrifice, often it was sex with a male or female prostitute. And that was the way you worship the fertility gods. And so that was what's happening at the temple of Daphne in Antioch. All that to say, you know, this becomes, Antioch becomes a major city in Christianity. But again, you think about what kind of city it was, because it was kind of a city that had a reputation for, well, why are you going to, what are you going to Antioch for? Well, you know why I'm going to Antioch. I mean, there, it was sort of a sin city. It wasn't the sin city. We have a couple other cities that are even worse. Corinth is the sin city. Um, Corinth is the Las Vegas of the ancient world. But because um, uh, what happens in Corinth, you know, stays in Corinth. Um, but um, but Antioch had its share of of what we would think of as basically debauchery and just illicit things happening. And this becomes a Christian center, a Christian place, and so. They go to Antioch, these, the, these men from Cyprus and Cyrene, they go to Antioch and start preaching Christianity and start having results. Uh, a, a large number of people, uh, presumably Gentiles, becoming Christians. News of this, 1122, <clears throat> news of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem. So remember, this is still the mother church. The, the, all through the book of Acts, the, the mother church is the church of Jerusalem. And they sent Barnabas to Antioch. You know, Barnabas become, is, is one of the people that we're going to see pop up again and again. You know, remember, Barnabas is the person who introduces Paul to the Jerusalem church. They're afraid of him. They're afraid of Saul of Tarsus, a.k.a. Paul. Barnabas is willing to give him a chance. Barnabas becomes a friend of Paul. Barnabas introduces Paul to the apostles in Jerusalem. Barnabas, way back before the horrible story of, of uh, Ananias and Sapphira, who dropped dead for lying about their gift, before we get to that story, we're told many people were giving you know, whole property to the church. And the first one they mentioned by name who did that was Barnabas. Barnabas that we're going to see is not only a prominent figure and the part-time, at least for a while, partner of Paul, Barnabas, who is the uncle of Mark, as in the Gospel of Mark. John Mark, the author of the Gospel of Mark, is Barnabas's nephew. And we'll talk more about Barnabas and Mark as we get farther down. So they, the Jerusalem church says, we hear there's all kinds of things happening in Antioch, but we better send somebody who's got a little bit more experience and a little bit more longevity in the faith to make sure what's happening down there is, is, is kosher, uh, is, is right. So they send Barnabas to Antioch to check up on this revival happening down there. So Barnabas, 23, he gets, to, he gets to Antioch. He arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God. He was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man. This is Barnabas. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Now, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul 
a.k.a. Paul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. What's really needed there is, you know, somebody who can be the point man for this ministry to Gentiles. And he wants somebody who, well, has a great story, you know, like Saul does, a former Pharisee who's now a Christian. Somebody who could speak the language of the Gentiles. Remember, Saul is a Roman citizen, which he inherited from his father and his well-versed in Greek. Saul is, you know, a man of great ambition in terms of, you know, he works like a, you know, I say works like a dog. He's, you know, go, go, go. And he is a, he is a dog with a bone. I mean, he is a debater. He will, he will continue to uh, defend the faith. So Barnabas, who is not nearly as maybe uh, dogmatic or driven as Paul, he says, Paul is the man, Saul of Tarsus, Paul is the man that we need to be working here in Antioch. So Barnabas goes to, to Tarsus and finds Paul and says, come with me to Antioch um, to be a part of this ministry there. Um, now, from the time we met, we met Paul in Acts chapter 9, you know, in the, in the road to Damascus, until now... Nine years later, okay? Sometimes, you know, when Luke says, after a while, you know, we realize he's, after a while is several years. So from the time of the Damascus Road experience to this story, nine years have passed. And Saul has been primarily ministering in his home area of Tarsus. Now, as he comes to Antioch, we're going to see the beginning of the stories of Paul that we are mo more familiar with. But first, he and Barnabas minister in Antioch for a year. It says they, they said they stay there for a, year. a whole year. Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught. And the disciples there are first called Christians. This is, this is a term that is not immediate. The, if you notice, the, the way they're referred to earlier on is followers of the way. The early believers of Jesus were called followers of the way. The Romans referred to them as Nazarenes um, because of Jesus being from Nazareth. Um, they, they sometimes called them the Nazarenes. Um, but it's there in our Antioch that the term Christian is first used, not as a complimentary thing, but as kind of a joke. Um, the, you know, I, I used to be taught, at least when I was younger, that Christian meant little Christ. That's not exactly the best translation of Christian. It's probably more like um, Christ folks <laughs> or those who, are, those who are, have allegiance to the Christ. But the, the, the Christ folks or the, the Christ group is probably um, the best translation of Christian. Um, but it was kind of I mean, it was kind of a mocking thing at first. Oh, there's, there was, they're part of those Christ bunch, that Christ folk, those Christ people. Um, kind of like, you know, some other terms, like, you know, Yankee was originally the British sort of term of derision for Americans, and then we kind of adopted it, Yankee Doodle and all that. But um, Methodist was also a term of derision at first. You, you all knew that, right? The Methodist was a joke. Um, at first, just a side note, since we're Methodist, when, when John Wesley and Charles Wesley were at Oxford, um, they were not the typical college student. Uh, they got up at 4 or 5 a.m. every day for an hour of prayer and Bible study. Um, they fasted. They visited the prisons. They, you know, and, and Wesley himself if you've ever read about John Wesley, many wonderful things, but also Wesley kept a journal where he recorded his, his, uh, what he was doing every 15 minutes. <laughs> 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 Just 
John Wesley's journal, every 15 minutes he wrote down what he was doing. Um, and, and Wesley was very, you know, I don't know what we'd say today, uh, you know, OCD or what, what term we might use. But he, he and the other members of their little Bible study group at Oxford were very um, different from your average college student. I mean, even back in the 1700s, college students were not, um, you know, they were a little bit, you know, they liked to have a little fun once in a while. Um, John Wesley didn't really believe in fun, uh, which is kind of what I say. He wasn't a perfect person. He didn't really believe in fun or recreation. Um, but he did believe in doing everything precisely and on time and methodically. And the other college students teased Wesley and his friends. They called them the Holy Club. They called them the Bible Moths. And they called them the Methodists because they were so methodical in how they carried out their day. So Methodist, this term first applied to John and Charles Wesley and their friends at Oxford, was not meant as a compliment. It was meant as kind of a joke. But the Wesleys adopted it or adapted it and started calling their movement the Methodist movement. So um, the word Methodist started as a joke. The word Yankee started as a joke. The word Christian started as a joke. Um, and that happens sometimes. Um, but it starts in Antioch, the, the use of the term Christian. Um, so, verse 27. Um, during this time, 1127, during this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for their brothers living in Judea. They did this, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Okay. So, the prophets. Um, in the early church, and this is the really early church, there were the apostles, those who actually had face-to-face -face knowledge of Jesus, you know, the actual people who had traveled with knew Jesus or the apostles. There are the elders. That was in each, as they started planting new churches in different towns and, and cities, those were, that was the pastor, the, the leader of the, each local church. And the Bible uses a couple of different words for that. Sometimes it's translated elder, Sometimes it's translated bishop. Um, uh, the word in Greek, episkopos, which we get our word episcopal, is usually translated bishop. But a bishop and an elder are all the same thing in the New Testament. It just means basically the pastor of a local church. So there were apostles, there were elders slash bishops, and there were prophets. And prophets were, the closest thing today would be a traveling evangelist, you know. Um, who just would go from church to church, town to town, preaching. Um, prophets, and remember, prophets, sometimes prophet means foretelling, and sometimes it means, as I say, forthtelling. In other words, sometimes a prophet would say, this is going to happen. More often, a prophet would say, if you don't stop X, this is going to happen. Or if you continue to do Y, this is going to happen. In the Old Testament, the prophets were often ones who had said, if you, all, if you people keep disobeying God, this disaster is going to happen. So prophet is often about foretelling what's going to happen, and sometimes or often it's not good. But this particular prophet says there's a famine coming. And in response to that, um, they said, well, we need to help the poor Jerusalem church. And, and you're going to see all through the book of Acts that, that the, the Gentile churches begin to, I can say, pay apportionments. Not quite that, but they begin to raise funds to support the Jerusalem church. Because the Jerusalem church, Jerusalem is the hardest place to be a Christian in many ways because it's the center of Judaism. And if you're a Christian, um, the Jews 
you know, if you're a Jewish Christian, the rest of the Jews consider you dead. Um, you know, they completely abandon you. They completely block you from work or trade or friendship or you know, anything. I mean, it, 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 you, are, you are on the outs if you're a Christian in Jerusalem. So the Christians only had each other to rely on. Um, often no one would trade with them or do business with them if they were not other Christians. So the Jerusalem church was often a very, very poor church. And we're going to see Paul uh, in his ministry often collecting funds that go back to the Jerusalem church because of their extreme poverty. Now, just a word about these so-called prophets or traveling preachers. Um, you know, not every early Christian writing makes it into the Bible. Uh, there's a book that's written somewhere around the year 100 A.D. that's called, um, I see, what is it called? It's called the, uh, the Book of the Apostles, or it's called The Teachings of the Apostles, is what it's called. And this is sort of the first, not really a hymn book, but it has the first sort of order of worship in it, like for, for Holy Communion. Like this is how you're supposed to remember the Lord's Supper. And it had some other just rules for the church. As the church is starting to develop and have some sort of structure to it, it has some sort of church rules. And some of the rules in that book are about a prophet. <laughs> like, if a prophet comes to your church and has a vision that involves him asking for money, he is a false prophet. That's what it says. <laughs> if a prophet has a vision or a prophecy, and part of that prophecy is, and you need to give me money, that is a false prophet. And gosh, 2,000 years later, some, there's some TV evangelists that probably need to read that book too. Um, if a prophet, a traveling prophet, if he comes to your town, you are to welcome him and let him stay at your house for one night. <laughs> If he tries to stay more than one night without working, he's a false prophet, the book says. Uh, so the, the, the prophets, they didn't just always blindly, if someone says, I'm a prophet, you know, thus saith the Lord. Um, there was ways to say, what's this person's agenda? Because the Bible continually warns about false prophets, um, which, again, not to go too far afield, but... <clears throat> It's very easy to declare yourself a prophet, to declare yourself a pastor, to declare yourself a messenger of God. I mean, on and on and on. I mean, you know, there are crazy people all the time who declare themselves to be speaking for God. Um, there are ways to say, is this authentic? Is this person have any, you know, Anyone vouching for them, any, any, anything that shows that what they're saying and doing is, is real and honest and true. I mean, there, there are a lot of people who use God's name um, to cheat people and to, um, you know, sometimes you get an email from somebody that says that they're, you know, somehow working for God and they need you to send them money or send them a gift card. Or, I mean, there's, there's a lot of... There are still false prophets. There's always been false prophets. There's always been people who try to use religion to cheat people and, and to fool people. And so that, that's, that, hap that happened in the early church. It, we're going to see some of it in the book of Acts. We've already seen some of it in the book of Acts. And, you know, it's, a, it's something that's continual for 2,000 years. But, so, this is who the prophets were. And this is how... Um, the whole idea of gathering funds for the Jerusalem church is first introduced in the Bible. Now, one of the cool things about this little tiny passage is it does give us a sense of time because it says it's happened during the reign of who? Claudius. Claudius. And from Roman history, we can date the time of Claudius. The emperor Claudius reigned from 41 AD to 54 AD. That's when Claudius was emperor of Rome. So, you know, that tells us at least a 13-year span. Um, this is probably closer to the 50s than it is to the 40s, if you just do the math. Now, remember, though, and this is always really hard and confusing for people to hear. It was for me the first time. Remember, 
we believe that Jesus was probably born somewhere between 4 and 6 B.C. Okay? That's possible. <clears throat> when, we, when they set the calendar, they were off by a few years. When they set the calendar, because the calendar, we didn't start counting time from the birth of Christ <clears throat> until the 4th or 5th century. Okay? Up until that time, time was was by emperor's reigns. That's how you counted time. The, you know, the fifth year of Claudius, <laughs> or whatever. That's how you counted time. When Christianity finally became, world, or not worldwide, but at least empire-wide, they started counting time not by the life of emperors. They started counting time from the birth of Jesus. And in the fourth or fifth century, well, how long has it been since Jesus was born? And they came up with a number, and we think they were off by four to six years. No. Does that make sense? That they were off by probably four to six years. So that, which means that really, this should be the year 2026 or 2027, if they got it right. Okay. That, that they were off. And that probably, if we're counting from the birth of Jesus, we're probably somewhere in the year 2025, 2026, 2027 is what the actual year should be since Christ was born. Anno Domini, A.D. It's a little late now to go change it. <laughs> it's a little late now to say, wait a minute, folks, we, we're off. It's actually probably 2026 right now. Um, but just know that based on, you know, all the things we know about, it says in the Bible, when Quirinius was the governor and the census and all the things that we know about the timing of Jesus' birth based on what Luke tells us about who was the governor, when the census was held, all those things, Jesus was probably born four or five years earlier than we thought. So he, if he was born somewhere around 4 to 6 B.C., means he was probably crucified somewhere around 28, 29 A.D. So <clears throat> by the time of Claudius, it's been, you know, 11 to 14, 11 to 20 some odd years since the resurrection. You know, all that just kind of place, how, lo how long has there been a church? How long have there been disciples? Um, you know, and, you know, if that blows your mind, I'm sorry, but it, it kind of tells you that people who really study all this, you know, and a lot of people thought, oh, Y2K, it's going to be like uh, this big thing, you know, Jesus is coming back in the year 2000. Well, actually, <laughs> they're off by a few years already, so, you know. Um, but just think about it. if you're if you're living in a time before any of our modern stuff and you're trying to figure out in the fourth or fifth century, how many years has it been since Jesus was born? How hard that is to figure that out without all of our modern things, you know. Um, anyway, that's just a little trivia. But anyway, um, now about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Okay. Of the twelve apostles, Judas killed himself. That left eleven, although they filled the role, you remember, with Matthias. But of the original twelve apostles, Judas killed himself. James is now the first to be martyred. James, the brother of John, the son of Zebedee, as in the original four fishermen, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. James is the first of the surviving apostles to be executed for his faith by Herod. But wait a minute. Which Herod? Well, I'm glad you asked. Allison, your time has come. <clears throat> And those of you folks watching online, I'm sorry, I I'm, don't think I can, you know, I don't have the wizardry to put, pop that up on the screen as we're doing this live. So I'll try to uh, explain it so that you can understand it. And uh, if anybody really wants 
be to email them this handout. Just email me and I will email it to you. Uh, email me at larry.varvel at fumcba.org or just go to our website and you'll find my email there, okay? Let's spend, because this is such an a important family all through the New Testament, let's talk just for a few minutes about the Herod family. Because it says here, Herod arrested some who belonged to the church. Well, there's a whole mess of Herods in the Bible, okay? And this chart is in some this is chart is trying to tell you which which Herod are we talking about? At the very top there is Herod the Great. Okay, Herod the Great. Herod the Great. Main part in the Bible is when the wise men, when the Magi, travel following the star, and they go thinking there a new king has been born. So of course they're going to go to the to the palace of the king. And they go to the palace of Herod the Great and say, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? And there's no baby there at the time. And Herod calls for the scribes. And the scribes say, Well, according to the prophecies of the, old, of, of the scriptures, the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem, the city of David a descendant of David. And the wise men go, oh, thank you. And they head off to Bethlehem. And Herod, who is not a descendant of David, Herod says to his soldiers, go to Bethlehem and kill every baby boy two years old and younger. Herod dispatches armed men to go to Bethlehem and murder every male baby. And that's, that's where we meet Herod the Great in the New Testament. Why was he Herod the Great? You know, there's not that many people in history that get to have the Great after their name. You know, there's Alexander the Great, um, there's Catherine the Great, there's Herod the Great. You know, there's a handful of people historically who are referred to as the Great. <clears throat> Why is Herod the Great? Well, mainly because Herod the Great did the total renovation of the temple. It was Herod the Great. The original temple of Solomon is destroyed by the Babylonians. They cart off all the precious metals and everything else off to Babylon. When the Persians conquer the Babylonians, Cyrus, king of Persia, allows the Jews to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. They do with much, much poor building materials, not nearly, uh, just, just a kind of a poor copy of the original temple. Until Herod the Great comes along, and Herod does this massive restoration of the temple, such that by the time of the first century, it is referred to as Herod's Temple. Just like they used to call it Solomon's Temple, it's now called Herod's Temple. So it's mainly because of Herod's massive building projects. Not just did he do the renovation of the temple, he had aqueducts built and all kinds of other major building projects. So that's why he's called the Great. He's also a crazy man <laughs> and a vicious, awful, horrible person. You know, we would know that from the fact that he sent soldiers to kill the baby boys of Bethlehem. But he did lots of other horrible things in his life. <clears throat> Herod had, at different points, ten wives. Only five of them are listed on this chart. Okay? He has at least 14 children. <clears throat> Although, again, not all of them are shown here. Um, <clears throat> and, and to follow the... <clears throat> excuse me. To follow the... We're not going to talk about all these people, but just to get to which Herod are we talking about here in Acts chapter 12. But just kind of interestingly, uh, his wife, uh, Mariamna the uh, first, she has two sons, Alexander and Aristobulus. Herod murders all three of them. He murders his wife and murders both of those sons. Okay. He also murders Antipater, the, the son of his wife Doris. So he murders three of his sons, one of his wives, and countless other people. Okay. So, but before 
he kills Aristobulus. Okay. Aristobulus has three children. Aristobulus, one of, Herod, one of Aristobulus's three children is Herod Agrippa the first. So Herod Agrippa is Herod the Great's grandson. Okay? So Herod the Great has a son, Aristobulus, and Aristobulus has a son, Herod Agrippa I. And Herod Agrippa I is the Herod that we're talking about here in Acts chapter 12. Okay? Because when Herod the Great, and all kinds of stories about Herod the Great. Her how did Herod even become the, quote, king of Judea? He was not a descendant of King David. He was not even really Jewish. He was Edomite, um, which is an Arab race. Um, but the Edomites in the first century, many of them had been forcibly converted to Judaism. So Herod was raised Jewish, even though he was ethnically Arabic. But his father, Herod's father, was good friends with Julius Caesar. Somebody you maybe have heard of. Julius Caesar, Emperor of Rome, and Julius Caesar appointed Herod governor of Judea, Samaria, and Galilee. When Herod the Great was in his 20s, Julius Caesar made Herod the Great a governor. And over time, Herod became very chummy with the king. Even though as a king, he was still under the Roman emperor. So he, he was not a king in the sense of having, you know, absolute power. He still had to answer to the emperor. But as a favor that Rome allowed him, instead of being called Governor Herod, allowed him to be called King Herod. Now, in case, a couple of the other sort of interesting things about um, one of Herod Agrippa's Sisters was Herodias. Herodias married Herod Philip the First, her uncle. Okay. Then, and by Herodias, when she married her uncle Herod Philip, had a daughter Salome. Then, Herodias divorced her uncle. Herod Philip, and married her other uncle, Herod Antipas. Okay? So Herodias married her uncle, Herod Philip, divorced him, married her other uncle, Herod Antipas. And there's the story you know, because somebody said, that's just wrong, and that somebody was John the Baptist. And John the Baptist said... Marrying your brother, or marrying your brother, or your husband's brother when your brother when your husband isn't dead, is against the law. And John the Baptist preached against Herod Antipas's marriage to Herodias. John the Baptist is arrested, thrown in the dungeon. Herod Antipas has a drunken stag party. You know who the f featured attraction was at the stag party, his stepdaughter, Salome, who did an erotic dance for them. Now, it gets really twisted here. <laughs> his stepdaughter, Salome, does an erotic dance for her stepfather and his drunken male friends, and Herod Antipas, in his jolly drunken state, says to his stepdaughter, I'll give you anything you want. What do you want? And she goes to her mother, Herodias, and says, What should I ask for? And what does Herodias tell her to ask for? John the Baptist. John the, Baptist. the head of John the Baptist. The head of John the Baptist on a platter. And so they have to go and um, they pull John the Baptist out of the dungeon, behead him, and bring John the Baptist's head to Salome on a, on a platter. So 
That's, that's the Herod family here we go. Okay, this is the Herod family. By the way, Herod Antipas is also the one that in the, in the New Testament when Pilate gets frustrated with Jesus and hears that Jesus is a Galilean, says, well, he's under Herod's jurisdiction. Let him go see Herod. Herod Antipas is the Herod that Jesus is sent to. And you remember what Herod wants Jesus to do? Walk on water. Well, do, do a miracle. Yeah, in Jesus Christ Superstar, there's, you know, that, there's a song in, in the musical Jesus Christ Superstar, Prove to me that you're no fool, walk across my swimming pool, yeah, uh, that, that uh, Herodias says to Jesus in, in Jesus Christ Superstar. Um, but I don't think that's probably a literal thing of what he said to Jesus. Um, Sorry. But uh, yeah, um, so that's that Herod. But you look, how many Herods are on this, on this chart, see? And the different Herods pop up at different places, if you look down at the, ne after the next generation after Herod Agrippa, you see Herod Agrippa II and Bernice and Drusilla, and you see, again, in the book of Acts, they're all going to pop up in the book of Acts, too. Um, so, the house of Herod is a pretty twisted house. But for us, when the Bible says Herod... <laughs> You're like, well, which Herod? Well, this is, so when you're reading the Bible, you're like, well, which Herod are we talking about? Okay, this is Herod the Great's grandson that we're talking about right here that decided to kill James. Now, Herod the Great's grandson, this particular Herod, Herod Agrippa I, uh, apparently, unlike some of his family members, was a fairly strict observer of the Jewish law. Um, Scholars say, did he do that out of personal conscience or to curry favor with the Jewish leadership? You know, we don't know. But he was continually trying to curry favor with the priests and the Sanhedrin uh, who <clears throat> mistrusted his ancestors because they, you know, they had no pedigree to be a king. <clears throat> so one way he thought to, to curry favor and get brunny points with the Jewish leadership was to start persecuting the Christians. And he thought, well, the one thing, I'm going to take this one James and execute him. So he does, which gave him brownie points with the Jewish leadership. So it says, he had James, brother of John, put to the death with sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, a.k.a. Passover. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. He intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. Okay, so in soldiers, a, a, a squad is four soldiers, and they rotated every three hours. Okay, so here Peter is put in a jail cell. He is handcuffed to a soldier on his right, handcuffed to another soldier on his left, and the other two guards stand at the door. So that's a pretty secure situation. Handcuffed between two, two more soldiers at the door, and every three hours they changed <clears throat> to four fresh guards. Okay, And because he's trying to be a good Jew, he knows... You don't execute somebody during the Passover festival. You know? So he's going to wait and have this trial for Peter after the Passover festival, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Verse 5, 12, 5. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, Put on your clothes and sandals. Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. 
Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. So Peter is like, oh man, this is a cool dream. <laughs> he, he, does, he doesn't think this is real. He thinks this is just, oh well, you know, he's, he's dreaming this or having this vision of walking out of the prison. They passed the first and second guards, came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. When they walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself. You know, which is, I'm not sure what the expression is here in Greek, but it's like, you know, I, I picture him just like, you know, like, what? Wait, this is real? You know, I'm really, this, this is not a dream. I'm outside the prison. I thought I was dreaming the whole thing. He came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. So, you know, now, you know, remember the word, Angelos, in Greek, it's usually here translated angel. The word angelos can also be translated messenger. So some people said, well, maybe it was just, you know, a daring escape, you know. <laughs> um, but it seems some pretty supernatural type stuff happening here. I mean, gates opening by themselves and this many guards and somehow not realizing what was happening. Um, you know, you can substitute the word messenger there as an an a alternate translation for the word angelos as angel. But um, God is definitely orchestrating this. How, however, you know, I think it'd make a great scene in a movie. However, this is actually happening. Peter gets out of jail uh, in a pretty miraculous way and ends up a block from the prison and kind of the cool night air. And he's like, whoa, wait a minute. I'm actually outside now. So... It says, when this dawned on him, <laughs> kind of like, oh, I really am out. When this dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Okay, talk about all the people named Herod. Here's another. Is the mother of John Mark, as in the gospel of Mark. Mary is the sister of Barnabas, okay? Because Mark is Barnabas' nephew. So we have Mary and her brother Barnabas, and we have John Mark here, Mary's son. And Mary, the sister of Barnabas, her house had become one of the main meeting houses for the Jerusalem church. Most scholars think her house is where they had the Last Supper. Why do they think her house was where they had the Last Supper? Well, if you read Mark's account of the Last Supper and the Garden of Gethsemane and the arrest of Jesus and etc., if you read Mark's account, and only in Mark's account, it says they left the upper room and went to the Mount of Olives, or went to, the, went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and a young man followed them wearing only a sheet. Do you remember that in the story? And then when all the, everything all breaks loose in the garden and Jesus gets arrested, it says the young man runs off into the night and the sheet comes loose and the young man runs naked off into the night. The Gospel of Mark is the only gospel that tells that story. And most scholars think there's a reason why Mark's the only one who tells that story. Because the young man was Mark. <laughs> and Mark was there in the house where the upper room was because it was his mother's house. And he followed behind the disciples to go to the garden and then ran off in the night. Now, we don't, it's never said, Mark never says in his gospel, and it was me. But everybody thinks it's curious that he's the only one who tells the story. We know he was a teenager during these events when Jesus is arrested, that he was too young to be a, a disciple, but old enough to be curious. And most, many people think that Mark is the young man in the story and that his mother, Barnabas' sister, is the, is the house where the upper room is located. Now, a couple of y'all went with us to Jerusalem or went to us to Israel 
there's a place where you can go and they say, this is the traditional upper room. It's probably not. <laughs> I mean, it's maybe, but probably not. I mean, there's just to know where that was. They, they, you know, hundreds of years later, they kind of said, well, this is it, but uh, it's possible that it is, but it's probably not. Definitely going to guarantee that it is. And, and a few of you who went with us to the Holy Land remember that it's actually uh, owned by a, a Muslim family. They, they let tourists in, but there's a sign on the wall in Arabic that says, God has no sons. <laughs> I don't read Arabic, but um, the sign is there because, of course, Islam does not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Um, so anyway... But I don't think that's probably the real upper room anyway. But, that's, again, that's a side note. So, they go to the house of Mary, mother of Mark, sister of Barnabas. Um, Peter knocked. Oh, so, so they go there where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter's at the door. Which I think, you know, again, if this was a movie, this would be the comic relief moment because Peter's banging on the door. Hey, hey, hey. And Rhoda says, that's Peter. And she doesn't open the door. She just runs back to the Bible, the prayer group that's meeting in there and says, Peter's at the door. Outside, you know, and their response is, you're out of your mind. In other words, Rhoda, honey, he's in prison. <laughs> he can't be at the door. He's in jail. We're praying for his release right now. <laughs> oh, Lord, please get Peter out of prison. <laughs> please, please, Lord, get Peter out of that prison. He's at the door. Shh, shh, shh. We're praying for Peter. He... <laughs> Please get Peter out of prison. But he's, he's right out. Shh, Rhoda, please be quiet. Please get Peter out of prison. I mean, you know, that's, this is where you have the comedy scene in the movie. Um, she keeps insisting that it, Peter is actually at the door. The, one, the thing they're praying for has already happened. You're out of your mind. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. Now, this is part of Jewish, I would say Jewish mythology. This is not scriptural, but in Judaism there was a lot of traditions in the first century, a lot of uh, beliefs that weren't necessarily biblical, but some of the rabbis taught. And one of the beliefs of many Jews in the first century was that everyone had a guardian angel and your guardian angel looks just like you. <laughs> and sounds like you. It looks like you and sounds like you. So, when they when she says, he's at the door, they think, well, it can't really be Peter. Maybe it's his guardian angel who's at the door. And, of course, some people still believe in that. Although, again, there's nothing in the Bible that talks about guardian angels. That, that's not in the Bible. Um, but I say they, they, don't, they don't realize it really is Peter. Peter kept on knocking, which you realize he's on, he's on the lamb. He's on the run here. Peter kept knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. They were astonished that their prayer had been answered. You know, which I think, again, you're like, wow, the thing you've been praying for actually happened. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the brothers about this, he said, and he left for another place. Wait a minute. James? Didn't we just hear that James got killed? Not that James. <laughs> James, the brother of John, was executed. This is James, the brother of Jesus. And again, we're going to see all through the book of Acts that Jesus had a brother named James. Because again, there's only so many names here that we keep passing around. Jesus had a brother named James that did not follow him during his earthly ministry. We know that Jesus' family, his siblings, thought he was, Jesus was a little off. They didn't necessarily believe he was the Messiah. It's only after the resurrection that James comes to believe that Jesus was the Messiah or is the Messiah and becomes not just a Christian, 
one of the leaders of the Jerusalem church because he is Jesus' brother. Um, which again, you know, to get into Protestants and Catholics and all that, um, Catholics, Roman Catholic, our Roman Catholic friends believe in the perpetual virginity of Mary. In other words, they believe that Joseph and Mary never consummated their marriage and therefore Jesus didn't have any siblings. And they believe that whenever the Bible talks about Jesus' brothers and sisters, which it does, it talks about Jesus having brothers and sisters, they say, well, that was probably um, Joseph's children from an earlier marriage. Oh. Um, which is why, again, trivia moment, which is why in many paintings of the nativity of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, Joseph looks old. You know, he looks, like sometimes Joseph is painted almost like he's old enough to be Mary's dad. Gray hair and everything. Um, that's because Roman Catholics taught that Mary was a perpetual virgin and never, never had sex. Um, that has more to do with St. Augustine and his belief that sex was the root of all evil than it has with anything in Scripture. Um, and that virginity was a higher state for, especially for a woman. Um, if you read Scripture, the plain reading of Scripture, and it, it says, Joseph and Mary did not have sex until after Jesus was born. That's what it says. I mean, and it talks about Jesus' brothers and sisters. The, the plain reading of Scripture is that Mary and Joseph had a normal marital relationship and that Jesus had brothers and sisters. But because the Catholic Church has this elevated vision of Mary as the perpetual virgin, um, Catholics think, well, surely that he couldn't really have had brothers and sisters. Well, James is his brother, James, and he is often referred to, um, to, to differentiate him from James, the son of Zebedee, he's sometimes called James the Just. Uh, and we're going to see him again in a few chapters as one of the leaders of the Jerusalem church. So just to uh, finish this story, in the morning... There was no small commotion among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. After Herod had a thorough search made for him and didn't find him, he cross-examined the guards and ordered that they be executed. Because Roman law said, if a guard lets a prisoner escape, that guard shall suffer the punishment of that prisoner. See that come into play when Paul and Silas are in jail with the Philippian jailer. You know, and some of you know that story. Um, but we're going to see that law or that rule come into play in that story as well. Let's finish this chapter. I've got just a couple minutes. So Herod, remember which Herod we're talking about. That Herod, the Herod that had James executed. Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there a while. Caesarea being the, remember the military capital of Rome uh, in Palestine. He'd been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon, which are coastal cities on the Mediterranean. They now joined together and sought an audience with him. Having secured the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, so like his, you know, aide-de-camp or, you know, whatever, prime minister, chamberlain, whatever, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. Um, this is a trade issue. You know, these are port cities, and they're quarreling with, king, with the king over trade issues and probably taxes and all kinds of other mundane things, but they're quarreling. So they ask for a, they go through a mediator and say, can we have an audience with the king? On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. Now, we're fortunate... There is a Jewish historian by the name of Josephus. And a lot of what we know about this period in Jewish history, we know not just from the Bible, we know from this book 
that this Jewish historian wrote about Judaism of the day. We get a detail of this story from the historian Josephus. It was a silver robe that made the sun glisten off of his robe. Okay. He sat on, he, wearing his royal robe, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, This is the voice of a god, not of a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel Lord struck him down and he was eaten by worms and died. <laughs> In time compressed there. And it wasn't like a giant worm came out of the ground and ate him. I mean, it was... Again, Josephus, Josephus, the historian, records that very shortly after this meeting, like the day or two afterwards, he, Herod came down with a horrible disease and died a few days later. And then was buried in the worms ate him then. I mean, so... Um, but the word of, the word of God continued to increase and spread. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. So, um, this, is, this is probably, again, one of the most exciting stories uh, in, in the Bible. We've had Peter and Cornelius. We've had Peter's escape from prison. But starting in chapter 13, the focus will now shift to Paul. Going forward, the, the focus of the book will now follow the journeys of Paul. And what will begin in chapter 13 is what's usually called Paul's first missionary journey. So that's where we'll start up next week. Let's pray. Lord, grateful again for your, uh, for your written word, for, uh, for, for people like Peter, and for the incredible um, ministry uh, that he had, uh, men like Barnabas. Uh, men like Paul, uh, women like Mary. Um, these are, are people that uh, we owe so much to, and we ask that as we continue to study their lives and your hand that was upon them and, and miraculous things that were done, uh, that you would uh, uh, simply give us gratitude and uh, increase our fear and our awe at who you are and how your church um, went from uh, uh, a few people to... Uh, uh, covering the world today, and, uh, and guide us and, and watch over us. We pray in your name. Amen. <clears throat> Thanks, guys, at home for joining us. <laughs>